Hello and welcome back to the class I've been teaching series entitled Introduction to Orthodox or Intro to Orthodoxy. I am Father John Brown, one of the priests at Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Marietta, Georgia. And we are now on our eighth class in this series. So let's go ahead and get started. For Orthodox Christians, God reveals himself to us through holy tradition. Everything we know about God comes to us through holy tradition. This includes both the holy, the holy scriptures as well as the interpretations of the Holy Writ. The idea of holy tradition is rejected by many people, especially Protestants. They see it as a hindrance to knowing God, not our primary means of knowing God. They draw this conclusion from Christ's words. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift of God, give to God then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. The apostle Paul also warns against the traditions of the Pharisees, which he was very well aware of, and he had lived much of his life. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. Orthodoxy agrees with these words of Christ and St. Paul. The Pharisees were take, taking the Holy Scriptures, twisting them into the opposite of what they are actually saying, and somehow the Pharisees took the commandment, honor your father and your mother, and turned it into, you don't really have to honor your father and mother. What the Pharisees were doing was unholy tradition. Orthodoxy believes in holy tradition. Unlike the Pharisaical unholy tradition, which Christ condemned, holy tradition is mentioned in the Bible and is praised. The same Apostle Paul, who warned against the unholy traditions of the Pharisees, affirmed the holy tradition of Christ as handed down to the Apostles. He writes in 1 Corinthians, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. So here he is basically saying, here is holy truth. Don't follow the, the Pharisaical traditions. Follow the true traditions of Christ that I, as, the, as an apostle, am passing along to you. So here's the first example of holy tradition. And it keeps going. The second, second Thessalonians chapter 2. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, either by word or our epistle. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. 2 Timothy 1 through 3. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Unholy tradition comes from the Pharisees and leads us away from Christ. Holy tradition comes from Christ, was handed down to the apostles, and has been maintained by the Orthodox Church ever since. So what are the sources of holy tradition? There are several sources. Holy tradition comes from several sources. All are important, but not all are equally important. Here are the sources of holy tradition ranked in approximately descending order. So the first being the most important and that the first is scripture, liturgy and worship, which includes hymnology and music. The third is ecumenical councils and canons. Fourth is the writings of the fathers. Fifth are the holy icons. And sixth is church architecture. We shall look at each of these. The first source and the preeminent source are the scriptures. And if you've been to an Orthodox church, you should recognize that picture where the, the, the priest comes out at the, at the, in the 
a, a little entrance and elevates the gospel and he says uh, wisdom arise and that's where the people are, are called to attention to see the gospel being brought out and carried uh, carrying carried in to the altar and so that's an example holding it high and say arise basically saying pay attention look at this this is our this is our bible we honor it in our little entrance and then later on in the liturgy where we're just before the we are, we proclaim and chant the epistle and the gospel uh, two times once once for each of the epistle and the the gospel we say wisdom let us be attentive so this is the church's liturgical way of telling everyone present if you're thinking about something else right now stop and listen to what is about to be proclaimed which is the word of god as contained in scripture the scriptures are the most are the first source of holy tradition and of paramount importance to orthodoxy. This is because they were of paramount importance to Christ. In the following examples, which mention scripture, this, in each case, this means the Old Testament because the New Testament had not been written and canonized yet when Christ said these words. So let's see them, let's go through them. I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. In the gospel of John, Christ says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. In John chapter 7, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will, leave, will flow rivers of living water. Later also in the gospel of John is this account. So he came to, to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Elsewhere, Christ mentions scripture in John 13. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may both be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. John chapter 17, Christ again, uh, all these passages point to Christ's reference, constant reference to the scriptures, which again in that time was what we would today call the Old Testament. While I was with them in the world, I have kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. John 19, they said therefore among themselves, let us not tear, but cast slots for it, whose it shall be, referring to Christ's robe at the crucifixion. These are the Roman soldiers saying this, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. John chapter 19. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. John chapter 19 again. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Later in John chapter 19, this is all in the, at the crucifixion. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. None of, not one of his bones shall be broken. Later, he says, then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have, in, ha, have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke continues from chapter 24, this account. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? A little later in the same chapter. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. A little later it says, therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Clearly, Jesus Christ constantly preached and taught the scriptures and conducted his entire earthly ministry in an intentional fulfillment of them. So we don't have to guess as to how important Christ considered the scriptures. The following, following Christ's example, the apostles also constantly preached and taught from the Hebrew Bible. At Pentecost, we read this. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in these last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Later in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul says this, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. A little later in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul also writes, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone be wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Paul also writes about the importance of the scriptures to his protege, Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. By the way, the Greek word translated here as the inspiration of God, the Greek word is theopneustos, which literally means God breathed. So in the inspiration of the scriptures, uh, it was actually theopneustos, it was God breathing life into them. This imagery is uh, connected with God's inspiration of the Bible, rela relating it to his creation of Adam. In Genesis, in the creation of Adam, it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So this creational uh, uh, breathing into the nostrils of Adam and, and, and possibly Eve is connected to the inspiration of the Bible itself. First Corinthians, as the Apostle Paul also continues the importance of scriptures as the source of the, the raw source of everything we know about God. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And after that he, was seen, that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then all the apostles. So there's a couple more mentions about how Christ's life and ministry, death and resurrection, uh, were all according to the scriptures. And then we also see the apostle Peter, Peter writing in his epistle as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do the rest of the scriptures. And so another mention by Peter about the importance of scriptures and not twisting it uh, to, to their own destruction. <clears throat> so this is why all this, everything we've talked about so far points to the importance of the, of the scriptures to, uh, within the Orthodox Church. Very oftentimes our critics will say, well, we believe the Bible and you don't believe the Bible. Well, this hopefully puts that to rest. That within Holy Tradition, the, the, the central part of it, 
is the Bible itself. But that's not the only source of our holy tradition. After the, after the Bible is the liturgy. Orthodoxy is unique in that we are not only drawn, we not only draw our liturgy from our faith, but we also draw our faith from our liturgy. In Latin, this principle is called lex orandi, lex credendi, which means the law of prayer is the law of faith. So we pray as we, as we believe and we believe as we pray. Put another way, is a quotation, he who is a theologian prays and he who prays is a theologian. More than any other Christian confession, orthodoxy cannot be fully understood without experiencing it, especially in the context of corporate worship. Now, in this context, by liturgy, we are referring not only to the Sunday liturgies of St. John Chrysostom or St. Basil, but also our, all of our services, which would include orthros and vespers and compline and all the other services, including all the prayers and all the hymns and all the poetry that they contain. It is normal for us to derive our faith from our prayers as well as from the Bible and the councils. For example, the Bible states that when Christ was born, he was placed in a manger. When Western Christians picture Christ's birth, as we would see in most of our Christmas cards, they imagine Christ's birth taking place in a barn, where mangers usually are. However, Eastern Christians picture Christ's birth taking place in a cave, which, by the way, the caves were often used to keep animals in the East, because in the East, especially the arid environment, there's not that much wood, and so they would save the wood for more important things, if possible, for that rather than just uh, pending animals, animals within, within them with valuable wood. So this depiction of Mary giving birth to Christ in a cave, you will see in Orthodox uh, Christmas cards. This depiction comes from and is re reflected in the hymns and poetry of the nativity within our litur liturgical life. For example, here is a, a verse from nativity or Christmas in the Orthodox liturgy. Mary was of David's seed, so she went with Joseph to register in Bethlehem. She bore in her womb the fruit not sown by man. The time for the birth was at hand. Since there was no room at the inn, the cave became a beautiful palace for the, que the queen. Christ is born, raising up the image that fell of old. And then right after that is another bit of poetry put to music from our Christmas services. Today the virgin comes to the cave to give birth to the eternal word. Hear the glad tidings and rejoice, O universe. Glorify with the angels and the shepherds, the eternal God who is willing to appear as a little child. So here in our hymns and in our poetry, especially connected with nativity, there's a little detail in there that, that uh, found its way into the tradition of the church. And we still, as a church, as reflected even in our Christmas cards, this depiction of Christ being born in a cave and not in, in a barn as is often depicted in the West. And then that brings us to the councils as another source of holy tradition. As we have seen before, the ecumenical councils are an essential element of the Orthodox faith. They take God's disclosure of himself in scripture, organize it into trustworthy Christian theology, and provide it with precise theological language. The councils also produced a large body of holy canons, which guide the church's administration and way of life. The council's definition of the Trinity, incarnation, divinity, and, human, and humanity of Christ, the full implications of the incarnation for Mary and the icons, and they, all, they form the theological vocabulary of the Orthodox Church for all time. The theological terms such as one, ens one essence and consubstantial and birth giver of God, also called mother of God, but more precisely birth giver of God, two natures, one person, and reverence versus worship. These all came from the councils. For example, we've, we'll quickly review this. We've talked about the councils before. But Nicaea, the first council of Nicaea teaches that the Trinity is three divine persons, each sharing one essence of divinity. And that word, one essence is usia. And the consubstantial, which comes from the Greek word homoousios, which is related to usia. That's what it means, 
homoousios, meaning of the, of the same essence. The Son is eternal and equal to the Father in every way and is not a, a created being. The First Council of Constantinople teaches us that the Holy Spirit is also divine, eternal, equal to the Father and Son, and not created. The Council of Ephesus gives us another theological term that's very important and finds its way into the holy tradition of the church. Ephesus teaches us that the incarnate Christ is both fully human and fully divine, not two parallel persons sharing a body, which is what was being condemned there, called Nestorianism. Ephesus also teaches us an implication of the incarnation. Mary gave birth to both Christ's humanity and divinity, not just his humanity. Therefore, she is rightly called the birth giver of God, which in the Greek, Greek is Theotokos, which you hear very often in our liturgies. That comes from Ephesus. Chalcedon clarifies that Christ's humanity and divinity were his two natures, and the Greek word for it is hypostasis, united into one person. Both Christ's human and divine natures are preserved. Christ's humanity is not absorbed into his divinity, but remains intact. Constantinople 2 and 3 taught that just as Christ had two natures, he also had two wills, human and divine, and two energies, human and divine. And then the last of the councils, which form an, a layer of holy tradition for us, taught that before the incarnation, God was incorporeal or immaterial, had no physical form and could not be depicted artistically. But after the incarnation, the second person of the Holy Trinity was now corporeal and could be depicted, depicted artistically in the form of icons. They are spiritually beneficial because they direct our attention to Christ or the saints that they depict. They do not become objects of worship. If they ever do, then that is idolatry, but the church rejects that entirely. They are given reverence, and the Greek for that is proskinesis, a couple of other, work, other words similar to it, but that's the major one, which is honor. It's, the, it's reverence, this kind of the, the type of thing when we go to a ball game and they sing the national anthem and we stand for the na national anthem or take our hats off or put our hands over our, our hearts, that would be proskinesis, meaning honor or some degree of reverence, or as a so soldier salutes a superior officer, that's honor or reverence or proskinesis. But worship is clearly defined as latria, which the Greek word, which is reserved for God alone. Then there's the sources of holy tradition, the next layer of of holy tradition are the writings of the fathers. In the context of holy tradition, the term fathers means all the theologians, biblical commentators, preachers and scholars down through the ages whose wisdom is respected. There is no single authoritative list of the fathers, but any list of the fathers would include these names. If you would go to different places in different times or different churches, this there, there would pr probably be additions to this list, but there would probably not be any subtractions from this list. It's, we've talked about some, most of these saints in the first class, so we won't go over them here, but these are considered fathers of the church whose wisdom, and because they, they, of their acquisition of knowledge through, from, from God on various subjects, we pay a lot of attention to, the, to these fathers. The fathers also include women, I hasten to add. Mary the Theotokos is the greatest human ever, who ever lived, and she was a woman. Other women publicly co commemorated and honored at every orthros and divine liturgy. Uh, here's a quotation from, from the liturgy. The holy glorious and victorious martyrs, the glorious great martyr and all laudable ephemia, the holy and glorious martyrs, Thecla, Barbara, Anastasia, Catherine, Kiliaki, Fotini, Marina, Paraskevi, and Irini. Those are all women martyrs and women that, that are commemorated at each divine liturgy. Other major Orthodox women saints include Mary Magdalene, Fotini, and Thecla, and all three of them have been given the title equal to the apostles. In addition to these are Mary of Egypt and Helen, uh, uh, Zenai, Sophia, Asclepius, Athanasia, Elizabeth, Potamia, Sebastiana, Xenia, Cassiana, Nina, Favronia, and many, many others. If you are interested in looking into this subject, 
more, I have a couple of books I would pass along to you. One is called The Holy Mothers of Orthodoxy by Eva uh, Topping. You can, if you want to pursue the, the mothers of the church, then I would in, encourage you to look at that book. Here's another one that I pass along to you. These, these are uh, pictures I took of a book that's actually in our library. So if you uh, go to Holy Transfiguration and you go to our library, you will see this book, The Lives of the Spiritual Mothers. So I put these out there for your consideration if you're interested in pursuing the, the spiritual, the place of spiritual mothers as an important part of, of the broader context of the fathers, then that would be, these would be great places to start. No individual father is considered to be infallible. Some even taught doctrines that were later recognized as errors, and this includes Augustine and Origen and Gregory of Nyssa. But the consensus of the fathers is a highly prized source of faith and practice in the Orthodox Church. They teach us what the scriptures and councils mean. We also do not consider that the age of the fathers to be over. We have contemporary holy men and women who are considered, um, will we ever, uh, could it po be possible that we could have holy men and women who are considered fathers of the church in our own day or in the future? There's no reason why that cannot be. Now we will talk about the last source of holy tradition uh, it's at the bottom of the list, but it's still valuable and important for us. We still learn from it. In, in the Old Testament times, there was the temple in Jerusalem and, uh, of the Jews. And it was, it was basically primarily a place of sacrifice. If we could go back 2,000 years and go to Jerusalem, and they probably wouldn't let most of us in the central part of the temple main thing that happened there was the offering of sacrifices. So you would see a lot of priests and you would see a lot of animals and they would all be being sacrificed to God at various times in specific ways. The public did gather there and there were function, there were times where the Israelites were called to go there on particularly feast, particular holy days. Um, but that they would not only, they would not be able to go out anywhere farther than the outer courtyard of the temple in Jerusalem. Inside that was the place only the priests could go, and inside that was a place where the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go, and only that was allowed once one day per year. That temple <coughs> was destroyed in 70 AD and has not been rebuilt. The Christian tradition, in the Christian tradition, temples are built with a similar three divisions as the original Jewish temple following the Temple of Jerusalem. There's the narthex, the first smaller room that you enter when you go into the church, and the net, which would be sort of the, the, the our equivalent of the courtyard, which was open to everyone. Then there's the nave, where uh, in the Old Testament, the priests could go, but that our nave is open to all people. And then the Holy of Holies is in orthodoxy represented by the altar, where the priests go and, the, the, and also the assistance to the priests. Christians eventually understood that God can be worshiped everywhere in the conversation between Christ and the Samaritan woman by the well of Jacob. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So Christian worship is not limited to one building in one city, which has been destroyed now for 2,000 years. Christian worship in the construction of Temple, Christian temples in the tradition of the Jewish temple uh, can be done anywhere. There is a depiction of the temple in Jerusalem, that outer courtyard you see, then there's a wall and passageway through that wall. That's the where the priests functioned and inside that tall building was the Holy of Holies. So that's that sort of the paradigm for Christian temples to this day. Then that, that same triple division in the temples has been continued ever since. This is a, a modern picture of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople uh, of vast proportions and it was a technological marvel in its day. It has that same division of the church space into, into the narthex, the nave and the, the altar. There are many beautiful 
churches in Russia. This is one that is quite well known. It's in Red Square, St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, Russia. Uh, it's designed in a very Slavic and beautiful and colorful way. It also has the same division of space as in the temple, as, as is true of all Orthodox temples. Then we have St. Savas Cathedral in Belgrade, Serbia. It's, I believe, one of the largest churches, Orthodox churches in the world in terms of space. In, in, in Serbia, a different part of the country, a different part of the world entirely, and it is, also has the same division of space. And then it continues down to our own Paris, the Holy Church of Holy Transfiguration in Marietta, Georgia, so which also, if you come to visit our church or really any other Orthodox church, you will see, see the, the narthex, the nave, and the altar following the same tradition. So to summarize, holy tradition can be seen as a layer. It's, it's not quite accurate to picture it as a pancake. It's more accurate to see it as a light bulb. At the center, the source of the light is the Holy Trinity. And that light is brought to us first by the incarnate Logos, Jesus Christ. It continues to be brought to us since the ascension through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which still lives and grants life and comfort and guidance and his Trinitarian presence is now to be found within the church. From the Holy Spirit came the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Holy Scriptures. And then outward from that, based on the, the Scriptures, of both testaments comes the worship and the, the liturgical practice and the hymnology and the music. And then the light of the Holy Trinity proceeds outward from there to the creeds, the councils, the canons, the interpretations, the patristic works and the doctrines and the dogmas. Out for, from there comes the architecture, the proclamation of the gospel and the iconography. The ultimate goal of holy tradition is not just to fill our heads with knowledge, but to inscribe in us and to to instill us with unity and universality and Catholicity and salvation and perfection. So this is a very, very helpful way to see the Trinitarian uh, uh, source of light at the, at the beginning and how it radiates out to the salvation of mankind. This concludes my class for the day. Thank you for coming and stand by. We have a, we'll have at least two more classes after this. Have a blessed day and may the Lord God bless all here.